afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the third and technical session exemptions and compliance required with respect to private limited companies of the two day conference on companies act i now request our mc member manjunath allor to escort our speaker ca vijay raja sir onto the dais and welcome him with a formal bouquet I also welcome C. S. Sri Lakshmi, Madam, onto the dais. I request our MC member, Sundar Prakash Jain, to welcome her with a floral bouquet. I now take the opportunity. to introduce our speaker for the day c a vijay raja sir it is a great privilege for me to um, introduce c a vijay raja sir who is my guru uh, actually c a vijay raja sir needs no introduction for us but this is an uh, formal thing so i am going ahead with it c a vijay raja sir is an insolvency professional he is a gold medalist in c a course and he has uh, secured ranks in various courses as well like uh, cost accountants law graduates company secretary bcom etc is a partner at guru anjana and has presented various papers on income tax corporate law and ifrs he has also held various corporate training sessions for toyota uh, state bank of india mysore mineral limited etc and he has also authored various books like law ethics and communication corporate and allied laws he has also coached more than 45000 ca students i welcome you sir once again the next speaker is ca sri lakshmi ma'am she is also an insolvency professional a chartered accountant company secretary and she has completed her msc in psychology She is currently a partner at Guru Anjana Chartered Accountants. She has worked with BMR Advisors and article ship with Mr. Vijay Raja sir. She has spoken and taken various sessions at ICAI, and she has also featured in All India Radio and Power TV. She has also handled various corporate training, career counselling, and campus placement sessions, and she has contributed to articles to the. Infinity Thoughts and co-editor of three books published by Guru Anjana. Thank you. I welcome you, ma'am. I now hand over hand over the session to C. A. Vijay Raja sir. I wish you all a very happy post lunch session. It's always a very happy thing to have a post lunch session for both of us, right? From your side, you'll be hearing a free lullaby. Yeah, Jo Achuta Ananda, Jo Jo Mukunda. You can, you can you can have a nice relaxation. And for us also, it's a very nice session because no questions asked. So therefore, I think it's a fantastic session, right? After tea, after tea, best, right? So that's nice. 
first of all let me start off by talking about privileges which is there in the form of exemptions now when we say exemptions i will be limiting my discussion in relation to exemptions given by notification 5th june 2015 and one more is 13 june 2017 so these are the two things i'll be discussing otherwise if you simply say exemptions on private company we can discuss a lot a lot we can discuss on exemptions of a private company this is like how you know most of the friends they will call up and they will ask uh, to your office what is the route you tell him where are you now say i am nani some shop he will tell howda all in the straight ba okay 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 you will get one circle ah yeah yeah circle there on the right can you see one temple yeah i can see one temple next to that can you see one small lane yeah i saw that lane ah that road is there now it is there don't go there he would have already gone because you gave so much of directions Saying that go then ah, it is, ah next galli ah, then it's, don't go there and then where opposite ikada left go now like that even when it comes to exemptions when i have to discuss i can discuss so many things which are absolutely not actually an exemption but i can call it as an exemption for example we can say if a listed company or a company which is proposing to be listed then it has to go for a prospectus Whereas for a private company, it is exempt. Obviously, private company, because the listing concept is only for a public company. So I can link everything and call it as exemption. So I can say that is also exemption. Correct. So therefore, there is no end to say what is a exemption. So I will limit myself to these two notifications, which are specifically about exemptions. So this will be like our Google map, which says route, take this route. If you actually say, they'll say, one more alternate route available estimated time of arrival yeah five minutes later so that five minutes later route i will not take i will take only this route which is relevant for all of us is that okay right in fact one of our uh, let me first start off by this so that that is important for me one sec here my gratitude to ICI, bangalore uh, our alma mater we are what we are today, thanks to CA Institute. Otherwise, the recognition what we get today is because of the Institute, isn't it? So this is our mother, which has given us this recognition. So my gratitude always to our mother, CA Institute, for giving us this recognition. So thank you, CA Institute, for this. Thank you. We always say that gratitude is the best attitude, which will always lead us to higher altitudes. So to have that gratitude is what is most important. So my gratitude to the CA Institute always, right? Whatever is there, because today when we say we are chartered accountants, that's ca still called as Lakome Ek. If you see the total population and compare with the number of chartered accountants, we are actually Lakome Ek. Actually Lakome Ek. And that's a great privilege to have, isn't it? To call ourselves as Lakome Ek. I think that's a beautiful privilege to have. So with that, and uh, uh, also nice to have one of the women speakers. First of all, rare to have women speakers. In that to have a women speaker on company law is again another rarity, right? So nice to have a women speaker here. Thank you so much. And it's so nice to see that, you know, one student this side, one student that side, one, some students here, right? So it's very nice to see so many of my students. It's a joy to see all of you. Thank you so much. And that's a great pride we get. I think the greatest gift for uh, a teacher is to see his student excel and go beyond what a teacher is. That is what we would like to see. I'm very happy to see all of you here. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, when it comes to teaching and when it comes to taking these sessions, I started to take these sessions only very recently. That is from 1992, right? So it's 30 years of experience. Some of them do look like less than 30. So that means they were not even born when I was on the stage here. So that's nice to see. But of course, uh, very recently, just two days back, uh, I was having a discussion with somebody and that person, for the first time I met him, for the first time I met him and I was talking, he looked at me and he said, uh, Ni wondo 30, 35 urubad alwa? He asked. I said, ha ha, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ni wusar I said, I am 48, gotagal alwa? 
ಸರಿ ಹೌದು ಗೊತ್ತಾಗೋದೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಅಂತ ನಾವು ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ವಾಟ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಟ್ರೈಂಗ್ ಟು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೇನ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಸಿ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ನಾವು ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ಟ್ ಮಿ ದಿಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಓಹೋ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ತ್ ಜೂನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ತರ್ಟೀನ್ ಜೂನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟೀನ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ಷನ್ ನೋಟಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ವೆರ್ ದೇರ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ದರ್ ವಾಸ್ ನೋ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ಷನ್ ನೋಟಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ದೇ ಆಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ವೇ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ಇಸ್ ಎಸ್ ದಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ಷನ್ ನೋಟಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಮೈ ಅದರ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಕೇಮ್ ದ ಮೂಮೆಂಟ್ ಹಿ ಆಸ್ ಮಿ ದಟ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಮೈ ಥಾಟ್ ಕೇಮ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ವೈ ಡಿ ದಿ ದಿಸ್ ನೋಟಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ yeah when you create one act you don't know how to create an act or what yeah you create one act then you forgot oh i forgot about private companies i'll create separately and give again one notification so in fact this should not have been there it should have been part of the act itself now as i'm going to discuss today i will be telling you a lot of things about interpretation issues so i think we should learn about a little bit of interpretation exemption will know but how to interpret that exemption will always help you in all other aspects of interpretations when you are doing something else also so let me start from there this is beautiful if you can see this picture yeah fantastic picture 1956 act we were like this zoom yeah this is how we were then they introduced 2013 it became like this because so many th- here 1956 act we knew and therefore we simply were driving like a race car then they said 2013 act okay 2013 act bike is there but what they did was they gave us one old bike because it was copy paste of 1956 number one that okay let it be old bike it's okay bike became old gone next what they did was they said notifications added that is what i'm trying to explain ah there were family notifications added circulars added extra circulars came in between extra and then amendments to companies act non stop amendments are there sitting there can you see yeah extra right these are the new amendments that has happened so amendments also started so he my student says i also want to enjoy from here let me also see what is so nice here and right so amendment started and therefore now the situation is companies act is not companies act full parivar so you have to go with the full parivar then only you have companies act okay fine i don't mind okay parivar is parivar so what my parivar only no so let us take everybody and go that was okay for me but the problem came about how to do the interpretation that is here this is where we had a problem ah this became a problem about interpretation right in 1956 it was correct now you can clap loudly it's okay it's allowed yeah correct thanks <laughs> i think i all of you appreciate what i'm telling now we don't know who is who abhi ye kon hai wo kon hai now full confusion 1956 there was clarity as to who is who now we have reached the situation total confusion to add to the confusion the latest report of the company law committee have you seen the latest company law committee report the clc report which has come recently next time when you go back check the clc report one more time okay you know how the wordings are everywhere she if she becomes director if she is auditor if she is so and so everywhere she ha ah, change now you don't know whether he na she na right ha ah, sir sir is telling she includes he this is what our school teacher taught us school only had so s h e and h e is inside s h e that is english but that is not what we studied under the general clauses act if if we all read the general clauses act general clauses act section 13 very clearly says that everything will be written in masculine and we should under, understand it to include the feminine that is what gcsa general clauses act right which is more than 100 years old legislation so very clearly told that when we create a legislation it will be in masculine but we have to understand it also includes feminine so it does not mean that when the law says uh, uh, he shall be imprisoned immediately women will say yeah i will not be imprisoned because only he has to be imprisoned at the right so if that was the same interpretation then we all convert like this i mean right so <laughs> okay okay now first of all let me start up with little history that is why did the uh, i am slightly stuck here okay i am slightly stuck because i can see if i'm here i'm there if i move this side that side then i'm gone so 
I will try to see. I think two steps is okay. Ah, good. Two steps, two, three, two, three, still, no problem. Saku, thanks. Thank you, Saku, Saku. Oh, they, all, they will also move. Good. So, digestion, okay. Then it's okay. And uh, uh, hi to all my online friends who are there. I came to know that there are more than 200 plus. So, therefore, we have a double century online. 300. Oh, triple century. Shreya, we run the Seva. Oh, superb. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Now, so let me start off here. Why did the process of exemption take such a long time? Now, when we talk about why, what was the first of all need for giving exemptions, then why it took such a long time to create? I've just given you the story here telling that uh, yeah, we all know that it is section 462, which is responsible, which gives the powers to the government to create these exemption notifications. And through that, therefore, it takes go through the parliament and, you know, parliament uh, sessions. It does not happen all 365 days. It only those winter session, summer sessions, etc., and the budget sessions. And then, of course, we had to take the public comments. How much public comments will make sense? Nobody knows. Okay, koti the comments. Yeh of koti the koti the comments. Yeah, I've never seen anywhere where you know we give public comments and suddenly entire act is changed. No day They will propose something, and full comments will give, but ultimately passed. Ange rite. Right? How it was proposed? Like that only it is passed. Hardly. One or two for Nam Kevaste. Yeah, Nimgu Sapakushi Agli and Taino. One or two will be changed, huh? <laughs> Correct. So, of course, they had added a lot of these exemptions later also. Now, this is an interesting question. If all of you can see this here, I've asked a question here. This is for our interpretations, okay? This is very important from interpretation point of view. And what is that? Hey, when you take, you should take at least two, three pictures because I should smile also. I should show it to my family also, know that I'm still young, right? So when we talk about these exemptions, the first question I'm asking you here is, would the exemption from a section mean exemption from the requirements, restraints of the section only, or will it, this is the important part. The second part, what I've asked you here, that is, Will it mean that the privilege or rights available in this section will also not be available at all? I'll give you one example, okay? And later on, I'll tell you with how the link will happen. You have section 62, subsection 1, basically talking about rights issue, 62 1A to be specific. Now, when one of these notifications tells us 62 1A exempt, that means this section will not apply to a private company. Ah, we can interpret by telling private company cannot issue rights shares at all. Because when you say 62 one year does not apply to a private company, logical interpretation is what? That means you can't issue right shares because the power to issue right shares came from 62 one year. And if you say 62 one year will not apply to a private company, that means you lose the power to issue right shares. But that is not the intention of law. I don't think that was meant as a intention of law. And therefore, going by the intention of law, we say when we talk about an exemption notification, because the notification starts by telling I'm trying to grant exemptions for ease of doing business. And therefore, it is not about the entire section being removed, which means it becomes a disadvantage rather than an advantage. And therefore, we have to read the exemptions only from the point of view of the troubles which are there in that section. So the troubles which were there will not be there for a private company. I think we are clear with that. So we have to limit our understanding saying that whatever problems were there, whatever conditions were there to be fulfilled, that conditions you don't have to fulfill if you're a private company. So that is a way you have to read any exemption notification. And that is what I'm trying to explain here. So therefore, if here, if you can see here, I've written here, if section grants a benefit, the benefit cannot be what denied. So you can't deny the benefit is what we are saying. So the section benefit will always continue. Only the troubles of that section is removed. So when you read an exemption notification, read it as if you're only removing the troubles, that's all, from for, for a private company and not that you're removing the section itself. Got it. Right. Then there is one more here, that is, is the exemption also applicable to private companies which are subsidiaries of public companies? Because what does it say? It says these are all the exemptions for a private company. Now the question came up, what about a subsidiary of a public company? This is a settled point now because of the definition of what's a public company. Now we all know that public company, not only per se a public company, but it also includes subsidiaries of a public company. So a subsidiary of a public company is like what we used to before call it as a deemed public company. 
it's as good as a public company and therefore these exemptions cannot apply to those deemed public companies. What I mean is subsidiary of a public company is as good as public company. That's what in, in simple words, subsidiary of public is as good as public and therefore you will not enjoy exemptions. So exemptions not applicable for those entities, clear. At any point of time, if you have any doubt, you can always ask me if you have any doubt. Of course, I've not yet started the actual session. So here, exemption notification is totally 22 exemptions. So I'm going to talk about two, two. Two and two, 22 exemptions. So I will be discussing 22 exemptions for you. So therefore the target here is 22 exemptions. And how 22? 16 exemptions was added from your 5th June 2015 notification. And then uh, on 13 June 2017, they added six more exemptions. Therefore 16 plus six without calculators, sometimes correct answer will come 22, right? So 22 exemptions we'll discuss and one exemption was of course a substitution. That means there was already one exemption given here. They removed that and made one new exemption here. That means it's only substituted the 2015 exemption. That's all it happens. Therefore, 22 exemptions is what I will be discussing. Therefore, let's start with our target of 22 exemptions. God bless you. I know before and all, you know, we used to see if somebody sneezes, no, we used to say, God bless you. After COVID started, you no, know, somebody sneezes immediately. One nimsha and so we will straight away have one nimsha. Yeah, yeah, Kriske Beda and Beto, we will remove and put the mask. Yeah, because we don't know what's going to happen next month, right? So, how things have changed. Before, when somebody sneezes, we say, God bless you. Yeah, may the Lord be with you. Okay, let's, let's come to this exemption notification. The power of giving exemptions. Here, I've given you what this notification. If we see under 462. Now, what we need to understand is this. This exemption notification is as good as amendment to the act itself. As good as amendment to the act. So if you read the act, act will not tell you this. So inside the act, you will not find it. So you have to add like our motorcycle, what I showed you. Yeah, act will not tell you, but you have to now add. So when you read it, you have to read it like this, this red width. This. So you'll say section so-and-so red width exemption notification that becomes the complete act. Otherwise, act is incomplete if you read only the act without reading exemptions. So I think you're clear what I'm talking about. Because if you see the wordings here, if you see the wordings what's given here, you see, it shall not apply. Either the particular section will not apply or it shall apply with such exceptions, modifications. So it will apply, but the section will apply with some modifications is what we are trying to say. I think you've understood what we're discussing here. Fantastic. Good. So let me now start off with the first change. I think you can give us first to start, ladies first, with the very first. So what I'll be doing is I'll give you, I'm giving you the list in such a way that I told you, can you see here one of 22? Uh, this is like the countdown because there are 22 exemptions. This is your first exemption out of those 22. Yeah, thanks. So I'll also have to come, okay, it is visible. Uh, so thank you, Bangalore branch, and uh, it is no surprise that I also followed uh, my principal's footsteps and took up company law. So I was Vijay Rajasar's article and uh, now uh, working with him. And uh, Srinivas sir called us uh, a couple of weeks back and he said there is this uh, CA conference, uh, what is happening today and tomorrow. Uh, can you please uh, talk? He said the dates were 24th and 25th. I said, sir, the exact dates, we have our uh, office annual uh, Day. So please excuse me that we can't come. And then immediately five minutes later, he said, Madam, now conference pre Devi, so please come. So that's how Raja and I, uh, both of us are here. And uh, he's called me here. This is one um, joker slide. Wherever are the red dots is where I will come in. Both of us are sharing uh, the sessions because otherwise, I know you all won't mind seeing Raja for all the three hours on the stage, but at least, uh, I have an opportunity to be uh, sharing the stage with him. And of course, any technical doubts any of you ask, I will only simply ask, Raja, can you please take it? So that's the way it is going to happen. And uh, the first exemption of uh, 22 uh, exemptions is what I'm going to speak about here. So 2 bracket 40 is a definition section, which is uh, talking about financial statement. Financial statement also includes cash flow statement. Now there is an exemption for DSOP. What is my DSOP? DSOP is uh, so like ESOP, you have DSOP. It is an acronym given by Raja. So it is easy for you to remember what this exemption is all about. 
CFS is not required for a dormant company, a small company, and uh, a one-person company, and then a private company, which is basically a startup uh, that is uh, taken registration under the DPIIT. So for them, CFS, you don't have to prepare. That is the whole summary of this uh, slide. And then I think Raja is going to come in now for the next sessions, and then I will uh, step in. Next is yours only, Raja. So I, I came in now so that I didn't have to uh, come much later. So this was one of the slides I spoke about. Okay, thank you. We can take the session by, okay, that will help uh, for what? No, no, it's nice. It's okay, right. So anyway, as far as a startup is concerned, I think we all know what's a startup, correct? Anybody who starts as a startup is not wrong, it's not the correct answer. So anybody who starts is not a startup. So actual, of course, if you ask in the public, what's a startup? Ah, very easy, whichever makes loss is a startup. Correct. No, high loss is there on the other startup, right? So, so that's not a startup. So the startup is you have to take a registration with DPIIT, right? So with the here, if I've given you with the Ministry of Commerce and Industries, you need to take a registration. Now it's very easy, of course, to take the startup registrations. It's all the online portal. So today we have the online portal, and through the online portal itself, you can make an application if you're a startup. Basically, one simple line of startup is uh, you must have some innovative idea. So it should be an innovation. And you should be solving some problem in the society. Some problem of the society you'll have to be solving. For example, most of uh, my friends of our era, thank you, thank you. So, yell clap So, right? So, most of our time era, we will remember, we used to stand in the queue. Remember, for movie tickets, we had to go early, stand in the queue, other will guarantee whether we'll get ticket or not, because black market only highest. And then we have to see, see a ticket secret and just go stand early in the queue for the tickets and all we used to do. Then innovation came. That is how you got this book, my show. All this started to come saying that, okay, you don't have to stand in the queue. Makemytrip.com is talking about, okay, you don't have to go and stand there. You can book it online. So all this is what you're trying to give a solution for some problem, correct? So I want to uh, get something. If you remember before, what we used to do at home, they should give us one uh, vessel. And say, oh, yeah, diddly, one, what I pass a tomba, they will tell. So we used to take, take one, you know, vessel and then go there and say, then I'll get for idli, what and all that. Now you don't have to do that. Ah, you see, you have enough of your, that means what? There was some problem and then they came out with a solution. So that is what we talk about innovation. So innovation is all about there's a problem and have you come out with a solution. If you think that's a solution, then yes, then that becomes startup entity. That's all for me. And of course, we all know in income tax also we require the definition of startup. Uh, ATIAC deduction is there on the chapter 6A. You've got 56.2 benefits in case of income from other sources calculations. So therefore, everywhere startup entity is a good point for us, including deposits. That is for us, even for deposits, you've got exemptions for a startup entity. And therefore, here also there's one exemption for a startup entity. That is cash flow statement is not required in you giving your financial statements. Got it. Great. Then we'll come to this. Now, this will take some time now. This is your two bar 2000, uh, the second exemption what I'm discussing and that is section 43 and section 47. So let me discuss these two sections a little more in detail. What is section 43 kinds of share capital, correct? Now, biggest question that comes under all this is when we see here, it says shall not apply, shall not apply. What are we telling for a private company? 43 and 47 shall not apply. Now, what is 43? Kinds of share capital. What is 47? Voting rights. So, what do you mean shall not apply? That means a private company cannot have any type of share capital at all. Private company cannot have voting right at all because shall not apply. No, can't be like that, right? That's what I told you in the beginning. So, we're not removing the section. We're only removing the difficulties inside that section. So, therefore, here, that is why if you see the wordings here, it says shall not apply where memorandum or articles of that company so provides. Now look at the wordings here. One type of exemption you'll find is shall not apply. And one more type of exemption is shall not apply where memorandum article so provides. So that means you have to provide for it telling that it will not apply. So especially when you're drafting MOAs and AOA for your clients, these are the areas where you have to take care of. Unfortunately, because it is not part of the act, no? 
if it was in the act, I don't have to worry about it. But because it's in the form of exemptions, we have to be very careful while drafting memorandum and articles for a client. And that is what I'm going to explain to you about 43 and 47 in detail now. So let's start 43 and 47 full in detail. Let's start. What is the impact of exemption under section 43? It talks about DVRs. DVRs is very popular, the differential voting rights, especially when there's a VC that is a venture capitalist or when there is some angel investors in your entity, there will always be this DVRs. That's called as differential voting rights, wherein the voting rights, what I get will be different from the voting rights. You get the reason is because let us say I put in 1 lakh of capital, but you have put in 100 crores. So if you are putting in 100 crores, you will expect your own differential voting rights, correct? You all, I think at least in newspaper, you would have seen Reliance uh, recently sold a small portion of its shares to Facebook. Very good. So a small portion of its shares were sold to Facebook for a few millions. Small portion, but sold for a few millions. And somebody who's investing a few millions, will he simply come? He will say, I'll have conditions, right? I must have some differential voting rights. And therefore, he'll ask for DVRs, correct? Correct? Now, when it comes to a reliance, because it's a public company, it does not have any exemptions as far as what it can do, what it cannot do. It should still simply follow SEBI. And it has to follow whatever is given in Companies Act. Whereas for a private company, if some investor comes and says, I want like this, I want like that, I can do negotiation like footpath bargain. You know what I mean by footpath bargain? Yeah, is coming mark only just you know, how you bargain or the tarkari bargains. Yeah, you are you are buying tomato, okay? Tomato you are buying. Insal pakapa. Insal pakapa. Yeah, we will tell. And oh, that's already gone like this, you know, in the thrust. So we can put whatever we want. We will never do this bargaining when we go to big malls. Imagine going to one big mall and telling uh, uh, how much is uh, one car? Sorry, along with that car, one scooter got put up. The car got one scooter got put up. That we will not ask. Only with that fellow we will we'll argue, right? So like that here we're telling for a private company, no problem at all. You can do whatever bargaining you want. I will take shares like this. You take shares like that. I will get differential rights as to voting. You take differential rights as to dividends. Everything is allowed. Why? Because exemption notification said for a private company, it shall not apply. So you're most welcome to do however you want. So therefore, if you see here, private companies are free to issue any class of shares. Absolutely, you can give whichever class of shares you want. You don't have any problem at all. So it can be with any differential rights. So in continuation of what I've explained, look at this. The definition of preference shares providing for what are the preferential rights also comes from section 43. Does that mean private company may have any classes of preference shares as well? See, uh, types of shares includes equity share and preference share. So therefore, as a private company, can I issue different types of preference shares? In our office for many of our clients uh, who have these VCs coming in, because it's a, a, she is an expert in the startup entities because she takes care of the entire all the startup entities and the VC fundings she's in charge in office she is leading she's you know uh, the past chairman was there used to always say that uh, she has grown very much with a short height yeah so so like that so she is heading a team under her there are 75 people who are working under her and uh, uh, with 10 chartered accountants, 20 company secretaries, and all the articles only de de dealing with startup entities, startups and preparing their MOAs and AOAs and the SHAs, the shareholders agreements and so on. And that this is a section which they use it very much in office. So we all use this very much in office, like we have Series A funding, Series B funding, somewhere you would have read it in papers also. Series A funding is happening, Series B funding is happening. Now when you talk about Series A, Series B, that means each category will be with different conditions. One funding will come with one condition, next funding will come with another condition. So you'll have series A shareholders, series B shareholders. So you can have any number. How come? Because private company, no restrictions. I think you understood the link between that exemption and how you're finding it with so many series of investments that are coming today. So you can have any number of series, therefore no problem at all for a private company. Then can a private company issue irredeemable equity shares? Because you, you anyway told kinds of shares does not apply. What they told? Private company 43 does not apply. Okay, I will give yeah, redeemable, irredeemable, like we have redeemable preference shares, redeemed after 20 years. 
ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಇಶ್ಯೂ ರಿಡೀಮಬಲ್ ಈಕ್ವಿಟಿ ಶೇರ್ಸ್ ಟೆಂತ್ ಎಸ್ ಇದು ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ಆಯಿತು ನೌ ಯು ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಗೋ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ದಿ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಮೇಕ್ ಚೇಂಜಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ದಿ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಇದು ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ಆಯಿತು ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸೈ ಓಕೆ ರಿಡೀಮಬಲ್ ಪ್ರಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೇರ್ ಇಮ್ಯಾಜಿನ್ ಐ ಗಿವ್ ರಿಡೀಮಬಲ್ ಪ್ರಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೇರ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಮೈ ಈಕ್ವಿಟಿ ಶೇರ್ ಹೋಲ್ಡರ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ರಿಡೀಮ್ಡ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಲೆಫ್ಟ್ ರೈಟ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಲೋನ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಈಕ್ವಿಟಿ ಶೇರ್ ಹೋಲ್ಡರ್ಸ್ ರಿಡೀಮ್ಡ್ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಯಾರು ಇದ್ದ ಕಮ್ಮಿ ಯಾರು ಇಲ್ಲ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ರೈಟ್ ಸರ್ ದಟ್ ಕೆ ನಾಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪನ್ ಸೊ ಯು ಕೆ ನಾಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ರಿಡೀಮಬಲ್ ಪ್ರಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೇರ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಪ್ರಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೇರ್ಸ್ ನೌ ಪ್ರಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೇರ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ನೌ ಲೆಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಸಿ ದ ಲಿಂಕ್ ಓಕೆ ಹೌ ಟು ರೀಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಹೌ ಟು ರೀಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ರೀಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಸೇಸ್ ರಿಡಮ್ಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ಪ್ರಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ವರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ನೌ ವೆನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ವೆರಿ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ಲಿ ಸೇಸ್ ರಿಡಮ್ಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ಪ್ರಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೇರ್ಸ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ಯೂಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಮ್ಯಾಕ್ಸಿಮಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಯೋ ಯೂನಿಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಕ್ಲೂಸಿವ್ ಯೋ ಆಲ್ಟೇರಿಯಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಮೆನ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಒನ್ ಪ್ರಾವಿಷನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಕ್ಲೂಡ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ಜನರೇಲಿಯಾ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಲೇಬಸ್ ನಾನ್ ಡೆರೋಗೇಟ್ ಯು ನೋ ಜನರಲ್ ಪ್ರಾವಿಷನ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅಪ್ಲೈ ವೆನ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಪ್ರಾವಿಷನ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಸೊ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಪ್ರಾವಿಷನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಸ್ಪೆಸಿಫಿಕ್ ಪ್ರಾವಿಷನ್ ಸೊ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಯೋ ಯೂನಿಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಕ್ಲೂಸಿವ್ ಆಲ್ಟೇರಿಯಸ್ ನೋ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸ್ಕೋಲ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟೆಲ್ಲಿಂಗ್ ಸಮ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಅವ್ರು ಬೈತಾ ಇದಾರ ಅಂತ ಇಲ್ಲ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಡೌಟ್ ಸಂಬಡಿ ವಿಲ್ ಆಸ್ಕ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೇನಿಂಗ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಫೀಸ್ ಇಮಿಡಿಯೇಟ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ ಆರ್ಟಿಕಲ್ ಕೇಮ್ ಐನ್ ಆಸ್ಟ್ ಮೀ ವೈ ದ ಪುಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಏನಕ್ಕೆ ಬೇಕಾಗಿತ್ತು ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ತಾನೆ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ವೈ ಯು ಪುಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ದೆನ್ ಐ ಟು ಡೂ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ವಿ ಹವ್ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ನೋ ಮರ್ಯಾದ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ವೈ ವೈ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ಬೋನಫೈಡ್ ಯು ನೋ ಯು ಆಲ್ ನೋ ದಟ್ ಯಾ ಪ್ರೈಮಾ ಫೇಸಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಐನ್ ಐ ರೈಟ್ ಪ್ರೈಮಾ ಫೇಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಆರ್ ಪ್ರೇಮಾಸ್ ಫೇಸ್ ಹೌದು ಇಫ್ ಪ್ರೇಮಾ ಫೇಸ್ ಎಲ್ಲ ಯಾವ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಇದು ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ಪ್ರೈಮಾ ಫೇಸಿ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ರೈಟ್ ನೋ ವಾಟ್ ಡಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೀನ್ ರೈಟ್ ವೈ ದ ಆಡೆಡ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಅ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಫೋರ್ಸ್ ಲುಕ್ ಎ ದಿ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ದೆ ಸೆಡ್ ಲ್ಯಾಟಿನ್ ವಾಸ್ ಅ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಾಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಯುರೋಪಿಯನ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ವೆಸ್ಟರ್ನ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ಟು ಡೈ ದಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ಟು ಡೈ and just to as a sentimental attachment to that language they said we don't want the language to die and therefore to ensure latin is still remembered they said we'll start using it everywhere in law just to give that remembrance right they said let us add latin there so that is how latin has been added everywhere that is why you'll find those words bona fide prima facie and all those things so i was also thinking from now on when we also speak i will start off from now on i'll start telling karmanye vadikarasye mahapalish yak and the sanskrit also is going off correct no right our sanskrit also is going off so i think from now on we should also add sanskrit wherever possible correct no come on when western countries want to preserve their language then i don't you think we should preserve our language also so i think sanskrit we should add from now on inal nalak word adru seri adanne heltare yeah at least if you learn four words but keep telling at least sanskrit sanskrit and so at least we'll also bring it i think seriously i'm telling yeah we should bring in sanskrit there okay so i think you understood this point right so redemption is because it's given under 55 and 55 is not exempt for a private company so 55 is applicable to a private company therefore only preference shares can be redeemable i think you understand
class of shares the company wants to issue only if you put that dialogue then only 43 will not apply otherwise you simply have to follow whatever is given in 43 am i clear so therefore yes please fantastic fantastic point again the question comes up is can this mean that i can issue equity shares without voting rights then we talk about 43 i'll come to uh, 43 also about voting rights but you have to read 43 along with you understood i think you already got the answer because voting rights is not discussed only in 43 you have what section voting rights voting rights huh it goes back it goes up further in 160 series correct wherein you when you talk saying that you cannot create any you cannot if you remember there was a there's a provision which says you cannot stop a shareholder from voting on any grounds other than calls in arrears an equity shareholder cannot be stopped on any grounds other than calls in arrears if there is a calls in arrears that's the only ground you can stop and that is not exempt for a private company Again, expressio unis est exclusio ulterior. So there's an express provision telling that you cannot stop an equity shareholder from voting on any grounds other than call scenarios, which obviously, and that is not exempt for a private company. So you have to read this section with that section, harmonious construction. Correct? Right. Got it. So I think you have to be careful while drafting your articles. Then look at this. Is it necessary for MOA to provide for different classes? Very important. Many of them ask me this question. Many chartered accountants will call me up and ask me this question. Sir, this client wants a new uh, type of share. Now should I alter my MOA? Because my MOA would have told, no, that this is my equity. This is my preference. Now should I again alter for every series? I said it depends on how you have drafted your MOA. Now if you have drafted your MOA telling that capital clause, I hope you all remember in memorandum we have a capital clause now in your capital clause in your capital clause if you have clearly written telling my equity share capital will be rupees so and so let us say 10 crores preference shares series a 5 crores preference shares series b 3 crores now like that if i mention then everything you do you have to keep on altering moa you have to keep on altering moa instead you only say total equity shares 10 crores total preference shares 5 crores over so inside the 10 and 5, whatever I play, whether I issue with DVRs or I issue series A preference shares, series B preference shares, I'll tell you where many of them make a mistake in drafting. They will write 7% preference shares. If you have seen, they would have written in the memorandum that 1 lakh 7% preference shares of 10 rupees each. Now that is a problem. There is no need for you to write 7. Why you want to write 7%? Because tomorrow the market falls again, next will be 6% shares. For 6%, again, you have to amend. MOA because ultravious. Yeah, Ashbury Railway Carriage Company's case. Anything ultravious becomes void. Correct? So then it becomes ultravious. So why you want to do that? I'll give you one small example. If you don't know how to do it, at least this much we all know. No? Take the example of a company like Reliance. Now we all know that Reliance has got different varieties of shares. And by public documents, you can inspect. You can inspect any records. Download MOA of Reliance and see. Only two things they've written. Equity share capital, 15,000 crores. Preference share capital is 10,000 crores over. That's all is written there. Nothing else is written. So that means what? But they have so many classes. Still, then how come? Why? That is because in the memorandum, they are not trying to commit telling 7%, 8%, series A, series B, nothing is commented. Therefore, you can issue different classes inside that 15,000 equity shares and 10,000 preference shares. Did you understand? Yes. And therefore, you should also be careful while drafting MOA. Don't put the specific class instead just put the broad classification 10,000 crores equity shares 5,000 crores preference shares that's all you write unless you can keep on doing any series in the articles I think we are clear on this clear on this superb so therefore just ensure that is taken care so the here here if you see here classification into shares of differential kinds need not necessarily be part of memorandum I hope you're clear on this it need not be part of memorandum unless there is any alteration in the face value because face value if you change everything will change because you would have told no 10 lakh shares of 10 rupees each so then you make it 5 rupees each then the memorandum has to 
change. Otherwise, you don't have to worry about changing the memorandum. I think we are clear on this. Clear? Right. Then come to section 47. There are two parts in section 47. One, voting shall be in proportion to the amount paid up and the other part is that preference shares shall have a right to vote. You know, preference shareholders have a right to vote on matters affecting them. And one more, they also have a right in case of two years dividends. If you have not paid two years of dividends, then they have a right like a equity shareholder. Now this for a private company, we are telling as per AOA. So that means my private company can decide here if you see, yeah, it may have disproportionate voting rights on its shares. Now you can decide, it cannot be without voting rights because that is of another section which talks about telling that you cannot have disproportionate voting rights, but otherwise 116 I think it is, ah, 106 correct. 106 which says that uh, it has to be uh, in that it says that only if there is calls in areas, there cannot be any other grounds. I think 1062, I think it must be, which says down below saying that any other grounds is not allowed. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that is not exempt for a private company. Therefore, automatically it has to be with voting rights. Great. Then as regards voting rights on preference shares, will private companies be free to decide however they want? We said two years if you have not paid then they'll get voting rights. But I'm a private company. I want to write whatever I want to write. Answer is I can do whatever I want. Why? Because we said 43 and 47 does not apply to a private company. So I can change the terms. So I can say when preference shareholder will get rights, when preference shareholder will not get rights, I can put those conditions in my articles. So I think we are clear on this. So this is a lot of scope in your articles, especially when you're dealing with uh, VC investments, because this is where they play a lot. All the bargaining happens here only. And our job is that only, our job in the meeting, no, they will be doing bargaining. Who? The promoter on one side and the investors on the other side. What is our job? We'll be sitting. They'll be, ah, ange, ange, they'll be discussed and they'll tell, 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 so, that means they'll ask us whether it's possible, not possible. We'll say, ah, possible. Okay. And put it in articles. So they'll only keep asking us whether possible or not, like what we discussed, saying that whether vote, without voting possible or not. I said, no, that is not possible. Got it. Ah, here is one more. That is about section 62. Would you take over this uh, so that I'll get a rest little, little bit of the change because Jana change can tell Correct, no? Right. Uh, three of uh, 2022. So I can walk the path he's walked, but of course I can't copy the jokes he tells, but uh, still uh, he's there to crack up, crack you all up. This is uh, for 62.1a1 and 62.2, which talks about rights issue. So you know that 62 talks about rights issue, E is ESOP and then preferential allotment. Those are the provisions which are covered here. In this one particular uh, exemption, what they have given is, in summary, basically, with shorter notice consent, it is possible. That is the whole understanding. But I'll read out this exemption notification. So in the clause 1a1, the following proviso shall be inserted namely provided it nothing withstanding anything contained in this sub clause in case 90 percent of the members of a private company have given their consent in writing or in electronic mode the periods lesser than those specified in this sub clause or sub subsection shall apply so what it means here is in when you take a rights issue there you would have decided that you will open the uh, issue you will open the you'll make an offer to the existing shareholders at that time there are certain prescribed timelines so you have this timeline up to 30 days where people can accept the offer in that the three days whatever has been mentioned that has been shorter which has reduced if we get a 90 percent consent so we have certain questions which will help you understand better so is the concept of preemptive right basically rights issue on further issue of shares applicable in case of a private company. So what it means is, it would be wrong to assume that the concept of rights issue on further issue is no longer applicable to private companies. This is the same thing which Vijayaraja sir started in this uh, beginning. He said, can private limited companies make rights issue? And we said, because if you read this exemption, you will think rights issue is not possible. No, that is not what it is saying. It is only telling that there is a particular exemption in the time limit only. So rights issue is possible and one with 90% shorter notice consent. So the notice. Sorry. In, bit, sorry. in fact, we had one case in office. One, uh, it was a private company. This private company, what happened was they came and uh, you know, most of these private companies, typical private companies, if there are, let us say some three people, 
those three only will be the directors those three only will be the shareholders also three directors they are only shareholders so they said we want to go for uh, rights issue I said very good you can go for rights issue then they said uh, rights issue we are going so today we'll decide tomorrow we'll go for rights issue because we are only the shareholders board has to decide rights issue then shareholders have to take it right so we said we are only the shareholders no no then i told them no 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 you have to give them at least 30 days time to decide then they asked to whom to give time to you only i said for, then they asked for what to decide whether you want it or not allah sir we are only deciding no no but you should give 30 days law is telling like that and now before this exemption notification came no it was held for us because act came in 2014 exemption notification came only in 2015 so in between what we should do full well, that is happened in 2014 case client is telling i want to issue right issue tomorrow no 30 days you have to wait then he asked for what no we have to give time for the shareholders to decide allah sir nave shareholders sir still 30 days time we have to decide like they can decide whether to accept reject renounce give them to allah sir we are only deciding everything no it was thought so ridiculous they are only deciding and they don't they have to give time to themselves to think about it and so therefore thankfully they gave this uh, exemption notification telling shorter notice that means uh, 90% consent if 90% consent is the same day today you decide board meeting and then evening you decide to go for right issue you don't have to wait for 15 days 30 days all that is not required otherwise you know for a regular company you have to wait for 15 days now the 15 days has come down to 7 days also correct now they reduce it to 7 days now but still the fact is 7 days is there no but i can't do it the same day but now i can do it same day with 90% consent that is uh, i also understood it better so this exemption is only with respect to the timelines for keeping the period of offer and for circulation of notice so that 7 uh, days instead of that you can go ahead and do it the same day is what this exemption notification made it all about private companies are still allowed to issue shares through rights issue so issuing shares through rights issue is possible so the same thing is again repeated here so with approval of 90% of the member it is possible for us to go ahead and issue at a smaller timeline there are two requirements of 60 to 1 the requirement of sending an offer letter within the timelines granting shareholders a time for exercise period of the option and secondly the manner of dispatch of notice as provided in section 622 so the manner of dispatch of notice is either through email or through the registered post so here through this exemption for a private company again with 90% of the members a period shorter than 3 days before opening of the issue of dispatch of notice of rights issue is allowed again the same thing we are elaborating here so to clear up all confusions with shorter notice consent you can do away with all the timelines which are given under the law so this is 90% of the members by value of shares so value is important and uh, that again is clarified here for you 90% of the value of Yes, and those are the members for whom you are supposed to get a shorter notice consent. Can you go back to that actual uh, exemption notification? The actual exemption notification. Yeah. Actually, if you see the wordings, what is given there in the exemption notification, it says consent of ninety percent of members. Now that becomes a interpretation issue. Now, when you say consent of ninety percent of members, what is that ninety percent? Ninety percent of members means the total number, no? That means if there are ten uh, uh, members, then nine of them should say yes. That's what it looks like because ninety percent of members means ten members are there in my company. Nine should say yes. If I have five members in my company, four and a half should say yes. Ah, huh? this is like how we have reservation quota. Correct. Two medical seats available for MD. Two medical seats, eighty percent reservation. That means one point six seats gone for reservation criteria and general merit zero point four. How to give? We don't know, right? Like that. Here also ninety percent. When you say of members, what do you mean by ninety percent? Is it based on number of people? Because you know private company can have two. So ninety percent of two. I think you understood what we are talking about. Then therefore, then we have to read through interpretation of statutes. Nositor as saucy. Those are again Latin words. nositor associ every enactment is known by the association it keeps in the other provisions in the same act so if you look at the associated words now everywhere where they talked about shorter notice shorter notice for agm agm also talks about shorter notice right for egm also talks about shorter notice now everywhere if you see shorter notice shorter notice the reference has always been to value 
and not to number. So therefore, it is not number of people. It is about the value. Whether the shareholders holding 90% of the shares are giving their consent is the correct interpretation. So therefore, you have to go by 90% in value and not in number. There can be shareholders with one one share and one more shareholder with 10,000 shares. Now that one one share, if you go by the number, then he will be greater than this man, like a Wipro. Azim Premji is one man, but we all know that he's got majority shareholdings in Wipro, correct? Right? And others, we, we all may be having five shares, two shares, 10 shares in the company, and then we say, oh, by number, we are great. No, we are not great by number because you have to go by value. How do we understand this? The only place where company law uses number is section 230. Section 230, section 231, 232, which talks about MDs, mergers and amalgamations. They are compromises and arrangements. If you see that there it uses the word, it should be number with value. And that is the only place they give importance to number, but it says number with value. Whereas here we are talking about everywhere else, even though by mistake in the drafting, they've used the word 90% of the members, it should be understood as 90% of value. Right. Thanks, sir. So again, we are specifying here the exemption is only limiting to the timelines and nothing else. So through this exemption notification, we understand that the timelines for a private company is not uh, applicable as per what the act reads and go by this exemption notification. In fact, thanks to the CA 2013, that website which is available for us, we can read the sections with the exemption notifications. And I was trying to prepare for this uh, seminar and the Bayer Act is what I had. So by reading of the Bayer Act, you don't get to understand these exemptions which have come in later. So with internet, when you try and understand any provision, it becomes easier. After considering the scope of exemption notification, what is the process of issue of shares to person other than existing members in case of a private company? So there is no change in the way the shares used to be issued under 621C. Like I mentioned, 621 talks about rights issue. 6201B uh, talks about ESOP shares and C is the preferential allotment. So in case of preferential allotment, currently there is no changes. That is same as is. Is the compliance of section 42 at all affected by the proposed exemptions? So Raja, this is yours. I think we are more or less uh, clear with the interpretation issues. So I can go off now further. Now, is the compliance of section 42 at all affected by the proposed exemption? Now, section 42, we are talking about 62, 62.1a, 62.1b, 62.1c. These are the three sections which are there for further issue of shares, correct? So, whenever you talk about further issue, so all of us have to remember this, we call it as funding. We talk about funding because funding comes through shares. So, when it comes to funding through shares, there are only three possibilities we have 62.1a, 62.1b, 62.1c. 62.1a, existing shareholders. 62.1b, ESOP, that is to our employees. 62.1c is by giving it to others. Now, 62.1c gets read with 42. 42 is talking about private placement. So, whenever we talk about giving it to others, we have to always go back to 42. And there is no exemption given for 42. Private company does not have any exemption for 42 and therefore 42 has to be followed and that is why if you actually see the way the wordings are very cleverly worded also correctly worded also wherein if you see the wordings here here if you see here it says section 62 subsection 1 clause a sub clause 1 can you see that so they're not telling everything is exempt so very specifically telling section 62 subsection 1 clause a sub clause 1 is what which will not apply to a private company, which is all about the time that is giving that 15 days, 7 days, 15 days or 30 days, only about that rest will be always applicable. So I think we are clear on this part. So therefore 42 will always apply, 62, 1C will always apply. So all those things we have to follow, we don't have any respite from those points. Clear. So then we know about this, I've already explained here, sorry, yeah, that is about this, 62, 1B, ESOP. Is a very simple point that is we know it by words uh, special resolution, ordinary resolution shall be substituted. That means what for a private company, whenever you're giving shares to your employees, ordinary resolution is enough, special resolution not required. In fact, uh, 
I don't know how to. Sometimes everybody will misuse everything. The client will be waiting to misuse so many of the provisions. Once we came and asked one client, saying that uh, you, have got, you have done an ESOP. He said, huh, we have done ESOP. But I don't find any resolution at all for doing ESOP. No, no, we have done everything. I said, but I don't find any resolutions. Then next day by the time I come back, all resolutions are there. Then I asked, what is this? They said, see, for a private company, only ordinary resolution. Ordinary resolution is not filed with ROC. So there's no track record, no. So there's no track record only of what form is, if it is special resolution, you would have already filed it, so you got a track. Now ordinary resolution, board resolution, there's no track. So they said, no, no, it was there. It is there, you didn't see it. Uh, the latest, uh, next session, that is after the T, right, when we discuss about the forms, I will tell you some of these latest uh, thought process of the uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs as to what they're thinking about these forms now. So I will tell you the latest developments which are happening because now the Mr. Rajesh Verma is the chairperson of the CLC, that is Company Law Committee. And you should see what all he has told and what is his plans for the future. So all the private companies are also will be in trouble. I'm telling you because now they found out that this is a super earning mechanism. Like income tax is a revenue legislation. Company law also has become a revenue legislation. Instead of a compliance legislation, it's turning out to be a, a revenue legislation and therefore next it will come. So post T, I'll tell you that also when we come to those aspects there. Okay, whether the exemptions brings any change in the manner of issue of ESOP, answer is yes. Instead of special resolution, it's only ordinary and therefore ordinary resolution. I used to always tell like this, special resolution means it's like dog and tail. Dog and tail. Whenever the dog goes, the tail has to follow. Obviously, so we say if there is a special resolution, the tail is MGT 14. You have to file one MGT 14. So wherever the dog goes, the tail has to follow. So if there is a special resolution, there has to be MGT 14. Whereas ordinary resolution is like Doberman, tail ella. It does not have a tail at all. So therefore, you can do whatever you want. Nobody will come to know us. Huh. What do you see? Hmm. It's for you. What do you see? Yeah? What do you see? Anybody? No, whatever. Whatever comes to your mind, you can tell. You yes, don't interpretation better. Huh? Old lady. You get it? Yeah? Young lady. Hi. See, the people are seeing what they want to see. Yeah. Old lady, young lady, correct. This is exactly a ah, young girl. Hey, Sadhya Kannada Lelila. Yeah. So, so, so therefore, you know, it all depends on how you're seeing it. It can look like that young girl who is turning that side. Can you see? This is like as if she is facing that side. She's turning towards that side, and that's a young lady. Or it can be an old lady where this is the nose, and this is her. So, if it's a young lady, then this is her neck with the chain, if you can see it. And young lady, some of them, yeah, bari old lady, it's all right. If you can't see it, don't worry about it. But there's a possibility of seeing it in two ways. This exactly what happens in all these laws also. There's always a way of looking at the law in more than one way. And that is why it is so important to understand how the judiciary would do the interpretation. So our interpretation should be, so instead of how what you can see here, what I can see here, more importantly, what judge is seeing. If judge is seeing old lady, angara old day. If the judge is seeing young girl, ah, young day. So therefore, our interpretation should match with that of, and therefore, whatever I'm discussing is from the point of view of judicial interpretations, right? So having said that, so if you see here, all of you, 67 restrictions on purchase by company or giving of loans. A company can give a loan to an employee to buy company share, correct? Company can give a loan to an employee to buy company share only. Why not? Infosys can give a loan to the employee of Infosys to buy shares of Infosys, correct? Which in very simple words without complicating can be called as you selling your own shares, correct? No, because your money, your money and with your money, he's buying your company shares only. Imagine one employee coming and telling, 
give me loan why i want to buy you i want to buy you so give me the loan so therefore we put restrictions as to whether a company can give loan to employees and how much of loan they can give wherein you all know this six months of salary is the maximum you can give as loan uh, if you're aware it is there which says maximum you can give under 67 it is there under section 67 that maximum you can give a six months loan etc what about a private company for a private company they gave us a full story i'm not going to read this story because this is why i gave you that photograph of that old lady young girl car if you read all this you know, it looks like only this private company is exempt looks like if you see the wordings here yeah it says we will not apply to a private company in whose share capital no other body corp all blah 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 is given there absolutely meaningless because act itself has very clearly told if you read section 67 if you have the bare sir, uh, 67 subsection 2 starting words stop no public company shall that's all so the wordings only starts with no public company so why you need exemption i don't know if you understood what i'm talking about you don't require this exemption notification because 67 subsection 2 starts with the words a public company shall not do so and so so and so then why you need this so it's very obvious that it does not apply to a private company so we say it is meaningless so this exemption notification is meaningless as far as a private company is concerned so private company they can do whatever they want okay this is clear ah here tiruksi tiruksi adhe road you go like this you'll come back like this only you go like that you come back like this only illa maadi like our hebal flyover Ultimately, you have to wait for one hour. You have to wait for one hour is always there. Like that only we are now talking about this provision here. If you see, that is about deposits. Deposits provision. Now, deposits provisions, you have to read so much to really understand about deposits. It's not an easy, I think there is deposit session is there, I think. No? Loans and advances, I think one session is there, correct, right. So as far as deposits are concerned, let me make it as simple as possible. I will not read the full story. I'll make it very simple. For a private company, if you are taking, first of all, we need to understand what do you mean by the word deposit. Deposit is not like FD, correct. Unfortunately, the definition of deposit in company law says anything you receive can be deposit. So if you receive some money, it can be a deposit. So loans can also be a deposit so whatever you get can be called as a deposit in very broader terms from a member if you take loan that is also as good as deposit only number one so if you from a member if you take it's a deposit but thankfully because of this notification this is what we have to understand number one up to 100 percent for a private company you can take that means 100 percent of your net worth capital plus reserves and surplus etc 100 percent of your net worth you can always accept as loan from your members absolutely no problem i'm talking about private company very important because normally private company will have these cash transactions when i say cash i mean the bank transactions when suddenly funds are not there then say Salva Kas Kotiro, uh, bring some money now then we'll you can take it back so these transactions happen you must remember that whether you're allowed or not allowed so first thing is up to 100 percent of net worth private company can always take from members first point second point no limit for startups for the for 10 years of course it used to be five years if you see here exemption notification says five years if you can see here yeah startup startup for five years but they increased it to 10 years now so for if you're a startup entity you can always take loans from your own members no problem no limit also you can take any amount and the third no limit for specified private companies and what's a specified private company that are given here here can you see here which fulfills the following conditions Right. If you are a private company which fulfills all these conditions, which is not an associate or a subsidiary company, where the borrowings of the company yeah, is not crossing 50 crores, if you satisfy these conditions, then without any limit, you are allowed to take loans from members. I think we are clear about this. Yes. So therefore, you are allowed to take money from your members. You can take it, but you have to know about this exemption. So even for a private company, as long as you are not having outside borrowings of more than 50 crores etc you can take without limit otherwise up to 100 percent of net worth you can always take loans from your members am i clear yes don't get confused with um, filing your dpt3 dpt3 no exemption the exemption is only in how much money i can take so therefore so be careful when filing dpt you have to file 
day 23 in disclosing all these money is whatever has been taken right only thing is that we are telling that you don't have to follow about uh, giving circular uh, creating a drra all that is not required because you don't have to follow cad rules corp you know the company's acceptance of deposit rules cad rules so that need not be followed correct then come to annual returns annual returns i think this mgt 7 exemption they have given now no use because now 7a has come for uh, small companies OPCs, I think you're already aware that we have got this abridged annual return called MGT 7A. So 7 is no more relevant, although they've given some exemptions for 7, anyway, not relevant because 7A has come. Correct. Then look at this signing of annual return. Now, who should sign? Now, here we are telling it should be signed by company secretary or by, there is no company secretary by director. One director can sign it, it's more than enough. Again, this is a there's a loophole. If you see 7A, MGT 7A form. 7A form does not give a provision for secretary to sign at all. There is only one place for sign signature and that is by director. So only a director can sign. So therefore for 7A only one director signature that's all is the place given. So therefore only he can sign. So this is what I have given MGT 7. Director will sign plus company secretary. This is something all of you must remember. If you have a company secretary, company secretary has to sign. If you don't have a company secretary then practicing company secretary. One of the practicing CS has to sign whereas when it comes to 7a just the director alone can sign although the law mentions uh, company secretary also can sign but in the form there's only place for director to sign so only director will sign then come to this this is very simple that is uh, 101 to 107 i think you all know about uh, notice notice for meetings correct calling for meetings then quorum proxy correct voting now all these provisions for a private company they have liberty what is the liberty these sections shall not apply unless otherwise specified in respective sections or the articles of company provide otherwise that means for a private company you can change the articles the way you want as far as notice is concerned what should be the period of notice we always say you no know, 21 clear days notice that and all you can change it how many ever days you want if you are a private company. So in your articles itself, you can say that you can give only 10 days notice, 5 days notice, whatever you want, you can change. So all these points are related to meetings. So all this, you can change it for a private company. So very important while drafting AOA for a private company relating to meetings, please make all these changes, whichever is comfortable for the promoters. Uh, what we will mention is that one liner, what I told you, like uh, uh, it shall be decided by the board from time to time or we'll pass a board resolution for it. Or you'll mention it clearly in your article saying that seven days instead of 21 days, your choice, right? But you have to still mention something at least, right? So it would always be better for you to mention it because uh, this becomes important where you will do away with a lot of compliances later on. So at the time of doing the articles, have these clauses and make it standard for all your information. Perfect. And it shall be, and it shall be decided by the board from time to time, right? right? Or by way of resolution. Because otherwise you need something, no? If you don't have anything, then you don't know how to run the company then. So you still have to say as to what, so at least you need a board resolution to say this is what we'll be following, correct? That you have to still mention, okay. Now, I'll tell you where is the clash. Uh, we all know secretarial standards, SS1 and SS2. SS2 says all about the notice, proxy, voting, everything will apply even to a private company. SS2 says, where here we're telling exempted. Now the question is, should I follow SS2 or should I follow exemption notification? Answer, exemption notification. Why? Because exemption notification given by boss, boss under act and then uh, notification. Whereas uh, secretarial standard, um, correct, no? So compared to institute, obviously the bigger boss will prevail and therefore we go by Exemption and therefore, although SS2 says you are supposed to follow, you can ignore SS2 is what I've given here also, right? Then what is the impact of not granting exemption for 108? Very interesting. Huh? If you see, they said 101 to 107 and then 109. 108 suddenly they missed. So 108 should be followed by all companies. So which means what? Section 108 which talks about uh, electronic voting, yeah, e-voting is applicable even for a private company if the private company has not less than 1,000 shareholders. If you have 1,000 shareholders, then even you have to follow electronic voting. 
I was telling this in one of the seminars. I think it was in Delhi or somewhere. The chartered accountant started to laugh. He started to laugh and sing, Tale diya. No, no, not in our language, in Hindi. So he was telling me, saying that what you're talking, 1,000 shareholders for a private company. Private company maximum allowed is only 200. From where you're talking about 1,000 shareholders? Because this law is telling if you have more than 1,000 shareholders, then you should, even a private company should give electronic voting. So he was laughing and telling what you're talking about 1,000 and this section will apply. That is why they did not give exemption. How it can apply? Because maximum you can have is 200. I said, no, read correctly. A private company can have 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 shareholders also. Oh, the, uh, because in counting the number 200, we do not count employee. Correct? So if I have a private company with 2,000 employees and I've given ESOP to all 2,000 employees, I actually have 2,000 shareholders. I have a factory and my factory has 2,000 employees and for all 2,000 employees, I've given ESOP. That means my private company will have 2,000 shareholders. I think you're clear what I'm talking about. So therefore, it is wrong to say a private company cannot have more than 200. They can definitely have more than 200. Did we understand? Therefore, because we don't count the employees for 200 calculation, but otherwise in the meeting, you cannot tell uh, your employee, side, hello, right? He's, he's still a shareholder, right? So you can't tell him like that, correct? So he is there. No, no, not, not counted. This is like telling the kids, hey, ata kuntu leke killa. Oh, hey, magar nahi hai. You can't tell like that, right? So he's definitely part of your company. Imagine them, right? <laughs> right. Then come to this point. 117 3G, this we know it, that's about uh, uh, filing of forms. MGT 14, normally we should say special resolution is there, MGT 14 has to be filed. Correct. But there are a lot of other provisions also where you have to file MGT 14. So MGT 14 is not just for special resolution. If you see 117, 117 gives you a list of not only a special resolution, but after that there are six more points. If you actually look at 117, so therefore, if I have given you here, if you see here, here, if you see, 117 contains a list of seven items which needs to be filed with ROC. Seven list, seven points are there. We all remember only one point, special resolution. Special resolution requires MGT 14. That's the only thing we know. But there are actually seven points which requires MGT 14, right from appointment of a managing director, MD is being appointed, or you're going for uh, uh, IBC section 59 for voluntary liquidation under IBC, then also you have to take care, correct? Or if it has unanimous resolutions, if you pass a unanimous resolution, then also you have to file MGT 14. So like that, we've got seven and that will apply even for a private company. So it's not exempt for all of them. We are giving exemption only for 179.3. 179.3, I think you know, that is when board of directors pass resolutions, board resolutions at an actual board meeting, 179.3. Only for that, private company need not file any Forms. Otherwise, you know, for a public company, every time board of directors meet and they pass resolutions for issue of shares, they pass resolutions for borrow, lend, invest, you have to file MGT 14. But whereas for private companies, you don't have to pass, I mean, you don't have to file MGT 14. So the question that came up was, uh, you know, 10 minutes, Idiyala. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah, watch not this, don't want first. Right? So therefore, here we are telling, yeah. Oh, the, I think, oh, postman more better because the session started, it started on time, no? It started on time? Because the next session also I am there. So I'll be here only. So even if you ask me to go, I'm not going. So no problem at all. So we, we can always continue. We have two sessions, right? <laughs> okay. So 173, 179.3 talks about where board of directors can pass a board resolution at an actual board meeting. For that, for a public company, they have to file forms. Okay. Private company need not file. That's all we are telling. I mean, I think we are clear, correct? But for rest of the things, you still have to file. Got it. Then this is uh, about us. 141.3G. Oh no, now they are expecting 5G. 5G ready act there. But this is about 3G, right? So what is about uh, 3G? 3G is eligibility for appointment as an Auditor. So when it comes to appointment of auditors, we are telling uh, maximum limit 20 companies, but in counting 20, there is exclusions. Who are all excluded? Yeah. OPC, dormant, small, 
and private companies having paid up share capital less than 100 crores. Uh, in this place, I want to know any of your clients, which is a private company with more than 100 crores capital. I'm trying to find one company. Yeah, more than uh, 100 crores because more than 100 crores, first advice would be go for IPO. Make it 10,000 crores. Andre. Why you want to sit with 100 crores is what we have always told. So we do not even allow that company to continue as a private company actually. So actually speaking, no limit at all. So therefore, all private companies, they could have simply told all private companies, but they told private companies with a paid up capital of less than 100 crores. I, it's as good as all private companies are exempted from this number. So in this number of 20, it can be any number of companies. One issue is there, uh, which I would like to ask you. you. You have to give me the answer. And that is, what is the limit for tax audit? 60, 60 tax audits per partner. Where is this given? It's not there in 44AB. ICI guidelines. Okay. What is the maximum number of audits a chartered accountant can take according to ICI guidelines? 30. Where is this? ICI guidelines. Where is which guideline is this? Yelly the guidelines. Yeah, guidelines though. So is the guideline still applicable now also? It is still applicable? Ah, that I know. I you. <laughs> Fantastic. Very good. I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. Why I'm asking this question is it has come through the General Council Committee guidelines of 2008. 2008. 2008 and then came the companies act of 2013 and then came the exemption notification after that so that means whatever guidelines we are talking about is a guidelines which was issued much before exemption notification much before 2013 act is the guideline so that means institute has not given us any guideline in consonance with the latest law because we say one concept in interpretation called as contemporanea expositio that means when you read a law you have to read the law at the time when it was made so when the guideline was made you have to see what was the surrounding laws at that point of time so at that point of time the surrounding laws did not have all this now you understand what i mean so your interpretation of the guideline will depend on that so therefore this is currently a controversy right because whether the guideline itself will apply or not number one and whether a guideline can override the act itself you understood what i'm talking about right so but then ultimately going by what is telling who cares about the act institute can tomorrow say get out that is a problem so therefore we still go by institute guidelines so therefore in spite of this telling that any number of private companies you can do an audit i've given you that also here if you see here Everything, all companies put together, this exemption waste, you know what I mean? That is what I'm trying to explain. I've written that actually here. I will show you that also. I've written everything here. Can you see here? Can you see here? Does this mean that auditors can take any number of audits of OPCs, small companies, dormant companies, private companies based on the notification? Answer is yes. By notification, I can take any number of audits. But if you see, answer is no. I've written it as no because apart from section 141 3g of companies act auditors are also bound by the guidelines issued by i say like what sir told right we are, we are bound by the guidelines of ICI. hence apart from companies act you should also comply with the guidelines of i say so we don't have a choice so in spite of this telling you can take anything we can't take yeah we have a limit of 30 which is that old guideline which still talks about uh, public company 25 lakhs if you are they know either 25 lakhs or 10 companies public companies with 25 lakhs are they know are they know central council salpa notice sir amendment yeah so to see the 2008 guideline it is okay but unfortunately we're still bound by that okay so in spite of exemptions we still have to follow 
see and shoot the guide logo. Can I come again? Correct, I know. So what he's telling it's a misnomer. That the word guideline, it's not should not be called as guideline, it should be called as uh, directions. Mandate. Oh, warning, correct. Then we'll come to uh, 143. Uh, 143, we love this section, isn't it? Why? Because our audit reports. Correct, no? Is all from 143, correct? That is why that word 143 and the correct, no? We love, right? We love 143, correct? Yeah, 143 only I'm talking about. Right, this is 143. Some of you, if you don't know, old generation, what is 143? Yeah, young generation, young generation, if I give, simply stand and tell when 143, they immediately reply, 1432. And the reply was like, immediate reply also will come, right? So, so we have got section 143. We love this section, of course. It is our love, 143, because it's our about audit reports. The question is, what about internal financial controls? Should I report? That is the point. So for a private company, what about my responsibility of reporting on IFC, internal financial? For that, we have got here telling not required if you can follow these conditions. What is that? It shall not apply. This is specifically for IFC, okay? Specifically for IFC. My reporting of IFC is not required if, number one, it is a OPC or a small company. And then the third one, which has a turnover of less than 50 crores as of the latest audited financial statements or which has an aggregate borrowings from banks, etc., which is less than 25 crores. So if it is less than 50 crores and 25 crores, then IFC reporting is not required. Am I clear? So IFC reporting will not be required. So for these three companies, OPC, small company, of course, small company definition we know has been now changed from uh, 50 lakhs and 2 crores. It is uh, 2 crores and 20 crores. It is 2 and 20 now. I think we are aware, right? Which one? Second point. Yeah, and this, the, this is, this R is very similar to what Caro has. You have a session on Caro tomorrow, right? A full session, marathon sessions are there on Caro. Because as an auditor, they keep telling us, ah, Caro, Caro, Caro. Ah, Caro, Caro, kya Caro? Yeah, Caro, Caro, and the Caro, right? So therefore, They'll tell Karo, 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 Karo. Now, when it comes to Karo, also, if you see, there also, if you see uh, which private company is exempted from Karo, there also you'll find the same words or or. You see, and we had the same interpretation issues. Is it any one or cumulative? So, mutatis mutandis. Right? So, right? So, so, the same provision will apply, yes. You're talking about this, right? Uh, that is why they went by the, uh, as on the la latest audited financial statements. Correct. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, two, okay, you're talking about uh, turnover, right? Yeah, he wants to know about. We'll put it this way, okay? Let's take a hypothetical condition that we agree agree with the argument, saying that 21, 22 is what you give example, right? Okay, 21, 22. Let us say turnover has crossed. It, it has crossed 50 crores. Now, if 21, 22 the turnover has crossed 50 crores, we are telling latest audited uh, financial statement were not less than 50 crores. Imagine it has crossed, and it should be audited financial statements. So this will be like the, the egg and the chicken situation. Which came first, Anta? Audit mode and then I should see whether IFC will apply. IFC might be damage check mode. You know, you know what I meant. Yeah, you understood. So, so it's like that. Which came first? Whether egg came first or chicken came first? I asked one fellow. Egg came first, chicken came first. Whichever you order, it will come first. You have to order more than one. Not, it's not some hotel, right? So, I think you got the answer. So, you have to always look at. Oh, you didn't get the answer. Okay, then you have to look at the preceding year. Because I have to decide in my audit report whether I should put IFC or not. Correct? 
And today, if I have to decide, if I'm sitting now and deciding for 21, 22, whether I should put IFC a comment or not, what is the latest audited financials I have? That's all. That is the latest audited financial I have for me to do this audit. I think you're clear. But the other aspect is, this is important, what he's telling, that is, here, when you're talking about borrowings, at any point of time during the financial year, now this will be 21, 22 full, 25 crores call limit. I think you're clear with this. So that borrowings have to see any time during the year. That's the, that's the important part. So they'll have borrowings during the year, but it will be converted into debentures later. But in balance sheet, it's not visible. But during the year, it will still be there. So you still have to go for IFC at that time. Correct. Good point. What he's telling is, uh, if I've already completed the tax audit, now the question that comes up is, can I call this as an audited financial statement? Because tax audit is not auditing the financial statements. It is computation. Tax audit is actually a audit of the computation and not about auditing the financial statements. Correct. Possible. Definitely it's a good, it's a possible argument, but we'll still stick with this fact of Nositor SOC. That is when we say audited financial statement should be laid at the AGM. When we say, no, can I say, okay, it was done for some bank purpose. It was done from tax. Can you put it? Answer is no. So the same analogy will apply here also. Yeah, right. And then come to this one. That is uh, um, 160. These are all very simple ones. So will you take it over at least two minutes? Thanks. This is a small section so talking about, yeah. So for a public company, we know that when we have to appoint a director, there is a requirement of a one lakh deposit. But for a private limited company, this has been done away with. That is this exemption. Independent director requirement is there for what company? So, so. As a regular director? Yes. He's not director. Correct. But is he going to be an ID? That is, is he, will he be called as an independent director or? Okay, and that will be in a, it is a deemed public company. Then you will attract 160. Well, I need to oh, 160 has to be taken. It's only for a private company. Because this exemption is only for private company. I understood your question because yours is a status change. First it is from board appointment, correct, as an additional director. And then you're coming to regular director. That means in AGM. From BOD to AGM, correct? You have to take it. If you, uh, this is, uh, his question is on uh, private company. It's a private company, but it became a subsidiary of a, if you see the wordings, no, in the definition of a public company, it says it can continue to retain the provisions in its articles of RLP. That is RLP can be retained. So that means restricts, limits, prohibits. All these three can stay there. RLP, restriction, limitation and prohibition. But other things you'll have to change. Because in your RLP, this minimum of two and all will not come. Because it's not part of RLP. You understood what I said? RLP you can retain as per your articles. Other things you'll have to change. So this confusion, however, was there in 2013-14 uh, when the act came and until this notification came, we've all taken that one lakh deposit from our directors. Yeah, in fact, even for a private company, we took it. If you see... one c that is uh, section rule 2, 
subsection 1 clause C of CAD rules, companies acceptance of deposit rules which gives you exemptions list. No, 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 in, in 21C, it also talks about anything which has been received as a matter of provision of law. You've got those, you've you got a big list, right? One of them talks about which is part of a legal requirement and you've got in the ordinary course of business. So what is the import of the exemption notification with respect to 160? So the section requires either any member or the incumbent director to provide notice of it candidature at ensuing AGM along with deposit of 1 lakh. This we don't have to follow for private limited companies. This is one of the easier provisions. Then 162, which is appointment of directors to be voted individually, shall not apply. So if you take the case of a private limited company, in the same resolution, can you appoint more than one director? The answer is yes, because of this exemption notification. So just to elaborate a little, the non-applicability of 162 to private companies allows them to appoint more than one director by passing of a single resolution or is the non-applicability with respect to the provision requiring unanimous approval for appointment of two or more directors by a single resolution. So because of this exemption with respect to the entire provision and private companies, they can appoint more than one director by passing a single resolution at the general meeting of the company. So because we know that the directors are supposed to get appointed at the uh, shareholders meeting, this particular provision through that you can appoint more than one director. Then minimum number of board meetings. So what are the minimum number of board meetings that are required for companies? Four. But private limited companies have this exemption where we can go ahead two meetings instead of four in a year. But uh, which private if you can see that correctly? So same, it is like the DSOP, one person company, small company, dormant company and a private company if such private company is a startup. That's all. That is the whole point. Not the regular private company. Regular private company still four. So some of the investor driven companies, they will have 50 percent, 51% or more shareholders who are not uh, Indians. So in case you have foreign shareholders, then they are not called a private company, which is a startup registered entity. So. If you have to be a startup, which is the private company, which the Companies Act talks about, then most of our private companies will come, which is not an investor driven board. So two company, two board meetings is sufficient. And then it says, instead of four in a year, two can hold. And then the gap sh between both the meetings should not be more than, uh, should be at least 90 days. That's the whole idea. So which means I can't call a meeting tomorrow and then one day after and tell I have complied with the provision, no. We are required to have two meetings and then give a gap of 90 days at least. In fact, uh, this provision itself is being questioned. From then we have been asking, why are you insisting that we should have four meetings? And I leave it to the company to decide, no? If they want to have meeting, they will have. Especially for some of the companies, we were telling them you are supposed to have compulsorily four meetings. Every quarter one meeting. The director got so angry. One director started to shout. And they said, yen motivates, sir. What do you want me to do in the meeting? And if I don't come, you'll tell vacation of office. You know, if you, if you bunk, you know, if you bunk any meeting, you will be have to vacate. No, in one year, if you don't come at all. So they, I told them, no, no, every quarter one meeting must be there. Uh, off the record, I know it's getting recorded, but this is the statement he told. Adangala, sir, every meeting one quarter. I said, no, no, every quarter one meeting. And the angala, sir, every meeting one meeting. What to do in the meeting? I don't know. That's right. So, <laughs> I don't know what to do in the meeting. <laughs> but then there are so many compliances today in the year that you are forced to have more than two meetings because so many forms you are required to file. You need to pass one resolution there. Uh, but you can have a blanket provision at the start of the year where you tell that a director, this particular director or one of the directors is authorized to file the forms on behalf of the company. At that time, if you have a blanket resolution at the start, then you can do away with more than uh, one, more than uh, two board meetings in a year. Uh, we need to one thing about OPC we all need to understand is for an OPC member is one you can have 15 directors you see you can still have 15 but if you are having only one director then the concept of meeting only is not there so therefore you don't have to worry about this provision at all.
will be a hitch in the forms. No? That way we got a lot of hitches in the forms. I know, I understood what you said. That's a hitch in the form. I think we're almost coming to the close. Uh, this 174 bracket three interest director for the purpose of quorum. Raja, you can wind it up with this. Okay. I'll take another uh, two, three minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, if you see, this is uh, 16 of 22. That means the 16th, 16th exemption, which I'm discussing here. So you got this, uh, yeah, I'm just writing it here only telling whether it's a 2015k exemption or 2017k exemption. So actually this will give you the reference. If you see here, uh, if you can see what I've written here, this I've written it as 11b of 2017. That means this exemption notification was in 2017. So that is how I'm trying to give you the link also so that you know whether it's a 15k exemption or a 17k exemption, right? So if this talks about 174.3 shall apply. With the exception, the interested director may also be counted towards quorum in such meeting after disclosure. See, first of all, can you have interested director? Can a company have interested director? I doubt, I think some of you know how you're thinking. Actually, yes, but if I say yes, you will not like it also. Yeah. So that is the correct answer only. The answer is every private company, every director is interested director. Because so the private company is like a sole proprietor for him. So he is definitely in most of the cases, the truth is he's always interested. Everything is interested. He'll be doing business with his cousin. Yeah, with his relative. It's all like that only. So everything they're interested only. So nothing wrong. That is the truth. Companies Act does not say you cannot do business with, you know it, RPT, you, have said, you went through this previous session. There's no problem with being interested. Only thing is what we're telling disclose. Disclosure of interest is what is required. We're not talking about stopping you from doing any activity. So here also we're telling the same thing. You will be counted for quorum, no problem. For a private company, you know, if you're, even if you're interested, you can participate provided you disclose. Just disclose and then participate. Absolutely no problem. So all these are like that only. Then this is again uh, the power of the board that is 180. I think you know this is not applicable to a, a private company that is about the section 180 which gives you those four points. You cannot sell any part of the undertakings, all that is there. No? That for a private company, they can do whatever they want. Then what is the impact of exemption notification? I've already told you, section 180 puts a lot of restrictions that without the permission of shareholders, you can't do, but here board of directors themselves can decide about these matters. Then disclosure of interest already explained that you have to disclose interest and then you can do the activity. You, even if you're interested, you're allowed to participate, you're allowed to vote, you will be counted, only you have to disclose. That's all is the requirement here. So the same thing I've explained here. Uh, 184, I will not spend time because I think you had a session just before this. 184 and 188, yes. Yeah, related party transactions already discussed. Perfect. Good. Ah, and then uh, uh, 185 is loan to directors. This is nice. Uh, previous slide, the previous uh, speaker has spoken. Next slide, next speaker will speak. Because you have the, tomorrow you have sessions on... Uh, Loans, correct? Tomorrow we have sessions, right? Intercorporate loans and all is there, correct? So all this under 185, you have these discussions, but just for your information, private company has exemptions for 185. So I've just given you that point. So anyway, in detail, it will be discussed in tomorrow's session. Related party transaction already discussed? Discussed? Yes, and voting by related party also discussed? Yes, 188 fully discussed, and then appointment of managerial remuneration. Uh, you are all aware that for a private company, there's no limits for? Managing remuneration and disclosure also, right? Aggregate is enough. You don't even have to disclose in detail. Every, everything need not be disclosed. So this also we are aware. Good. So that's all it is here. These are all the same thing. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask me break a bad. Break a bad, we will see again for the second session. There I'll tell you about compliance and the filings. In the filings part, I'll tell you about the latest developments with the <coughs> secretary of MCA. Yeah, he's studying. Yeah. Come again. Ah, version three. This is like that uh, robo. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you break about. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the session. You can give a round of applause for that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.